are holding uh, this uh, panel uh, to mark the, uh, the publication uh, of Assassination of a Saint, the plot to murder Oscar Romero and the quest to bring his killers to justice uh, by Matt Eisenbratt, who is uh, sitting um, imme immediately uh, to my left. Uh, Matt Eisenbrand um, is a lawyer. He served as uh, legal director for the, uh, the Center for Justice and Accountability, uh, an organization uh, based in San Francisco that has played a leading role in efforts to, uh, to promote uh, accountability for uh, gross human rights abuses and has particularly focused uh, on the abuses that took place uh, in uh, El Salvador and, uh, and Guatemala. Um, Matt uh, today uh, works for the uh, Canadian Center for International, International. Uh, Justice, um, so he's still uh, engaged in the, uh, the same uh, struggle. Uh, and then uh, to his left is Patty Blum, uh, an attorney who has uh, played a leading role, perhaps the leading role, in the, uh, the litigation of the, uh, the Center for Justice and Accountability. Uh, and uh, she is um, clinical professor of law emerita uh, at the University of California at Berkeley, and uh, she is also uh, today the, uh, the director of the, um, the Human Rights um, Institute uh, at uh, Cardozo uh, Law School here in uh, New York. Uh, and to her left at the other end of the table, and I'm going to, uh, to begin with him, uh, is Ray Bonna. Uh, Ray is uh, an investigative journalist who has uh, reported from uh, all over the world, uh, but like it or not, he is uh, permanently associated in uh, the minds of uh, uh, many of us who uh, recall that period uh, with uh, his uh, work in El Salvador at the time of the, uh, the beginning uh, of the, um, the armed conflict uh, in El Salvador. And Ray, uh, I, I wonder if you would start us off by talking about what it was like uh, to be a, a journalist um, in El Salvador uh, at that time, and uh, I'll ask a sort of follow-up question uh, at the same time. Uh, we're at a moment uh, where uh, the, uh, the President of the United States uh, is engaged in uh, certain attacks uh, on uh, journalists. And I wonder if uh, that calls to mind uh, any of your own experiences. So, Ray? Yeah. Well, thank you. And Matt, congratulations on a terrific book and even more for your work with CJA and, and pursuing accountability. And Patty, the same thing. I mean, we, we forget these things. They're so easy, easy for me to forget. I mean, it's what, 40 years ago at least. And it's good that you don't forget and you hold some of these people accountable, and I, I truly applaud both of you for, for the work that you do. What was it like? Um, well, I arrived in El Salvador. I was a lawyer <coughs> doing this kind of work. Uh, dropped out, went to Central America, got to El Salvador on Sunday. The nuns were killed on Tuesday. The rest is history. So I got there shortly after um, Romero had been killed, I mean, six, eight months later. Uh, it's hard to believe now, some of you will remember this, but those of you who are younger, it's hard to believe Central America was the biggest foreign policy issue at the time. I mean, it was as big then as the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, you name it, is now. This was where the Reagan administration was, quote, unquote, going to draw the line against the advance of communism. So it was, it was a big story, although it didn't become a big story until they killed the American church women. Ten, until that time, 10,000 Salvadorans had been killed in 1980. I think that was the number, something like that. We didn't pay a lot of attention. And then when they killed the Americans, you can see a bit of cynicism in my voice. And when they killed the Americans, then it became a big story. Uh, yes, the press, I, I, I did come under attack. Uh, 
by the Wall Street Journal and the Reagan administration. Uh, but I just read something before I came here about <clears throat> Jack Schaefer um, about the attacks on the press now. And his last line was, quit whining, just go out and write another story. And that's kind of the way I felt at the time. And I felt kind of privileged. And I'm not saying this in some kind of a arrogant way. I mean, I felt, all right, they'll say what they want to say, and I'll go out and write another story. I remember the movie Continental Divide. I think it's based on Mike Royko. You know, he was the same way. You know, they come after you, go write another story. And I think that, that was the attitude then. And it was easy also being so far away. If you weren't here, you didn't, you didn't see it day after day. It wasn't in your face. I, and we didn't have mobile phones. We weren't reading everything every minute. So I basically didn't know what was going on back in the United States. And uh, it made it easier, easier to keep going. And it was different for journalists. I'll just say one more thing. Journalism wasn't as dangerous then as it is now. I mean, there were, you know, they, remember there was the death squad, the hit list of journalists that were supposed to be on, and we made T-shirts, you know, and uh, with a bullet on the back and then the list on the front. I would go running every morning past soldiers with their rifles. After I'd written, well, you know, <laughs> people have wondered about my sanity for a long time. <laughs> Longer than I've known you are, <laughs> and certainly ever since. But you know, and and after, but after I wrote, went in with the guerrillas and wrote about El Masote, I still went back in through the airport. I, it, it, we weren't targeted. You might be. There were journalists who were killed in Central America, of course. But we journalists weren't targets the way they are now. And you know what? I think it changed. Our, and this is your field. I think it changed with Chechnya when they killed the ICRC workers in Chechnya. And I think that changed. I mean, this is a whole different subject, but. There were denunciations of yeah. the, uh, the press. And uh, yeah, some of that uh, focused on you, uh, some of that focused on uh, the El Mazzotti uh, story, which was um, the biggest yeah. um, uh, story of, of that period. Yeah, there were. And I, and I, I, I remember saying it. I mean, I don't want to make light of it, but I remember saying at the time, look, I, I give people a hard time. That's my job as a journalist. And so you, you got to take it. You got to take some of this criticism. But on the other hand, I remember saying that once at, a, at the press club in, in Washington. And Pat Tyler, I mean, he didn't even know him then, but he was the Washington Post stood up and said, yeah, but you got to remember it has an effect on everybody. Because if they can go after a New York Times reporter like this, and, and I did have people tell me, when they went to Central America after me, I'm not going to let happen to me what happened to you. Well, and there was an effect upon uh, right. the way the New York Times dealt with you. You want to get into No, no. Nah, nah. It's history. It's 50 years ago, 40 years ago. It's not important. It, it, it seemed very important uh, oh, yeah, at the time. Well, it was a Times reporter who said it to me. I'm not going to let happen to you what happened. Uh, what happened to you happened to me. So I think you're probably right. And I think I think, in fact, I was just reading it and looking. I found my book again that I believe it was the editor of, and it's, I think it was Miami Herald said, you know, don't don't let this happen to us. So it does have an effect. Of course, they don't. They, they know what they're doing. And uh, these attacks are going to have an effect. Of course, they are. We just get on with our jobs. We, you know, we're very privileged. We're very privileged. We can go out and write another story. And I used to think that way. I think, all right, I'd go, you know, I'd go out the next day and go out and find another massacre, or another village where there was killing. Yeah. Well, anyway, if you don't mind. I, I'll give you my own take uh, okay. on, on, on this, uh, and that is. Um, there is um, a certain amount of embarrassment um, in um, some of the major media in the way in which uh, you were treated um, by the, um, the New York Times uh, at that time, uh, and that in fact uh, it has um, helped to stiffen the backbone um, of the, um, uh, the New York Times uh, or other media today. 
that they have uh, engaged in a level of resistance uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, quite remarkable. Um, if that's the case, then obviously that's good. We're certainly going to need it. Okay. Um, having gone, you've been engaged in uh, the effort to, uh, to hold accountable uh, those who were uh, responsible for gross abuses uh, in, in El Salvador. Uh, tell us what that has been like. Um, Thank you, Aurier. Um, the first thing I wanted to say, of course, is I'm just completely ecstatic to be here because Matt, I don't, how long was the journey, Matt, of this ten book? Years. Okay. <laughs> it was 10 years ago that, um, you know, uh, Matt said he wanted to write a book um, about the work that we had done together um, with others on the, the assassination of Oscar Romero. And here's this incredible uh, story in this book. And the story, I just want to locate the story a little bit back a few years, which is that um, when Center for Justice and Accountability was founded in 1998, um, and it was one of the few kind of human rights, non-governmental organizations in the San Francisco Bay Area, I was teaching at Berkeley at the time and approached the new legal director of the uh, center and said, we have to work on El Salvador. And she had been somebody I knew prior to that time. We both had worked on Central American refugee issues in the 1980s. And, you know, here was this opportunity to focus again on El Salvador. And the, I, I sort of want to explain just for a minute, like, how that decision was made. I think it's really important to think about for anybody who does public interest social justice type law to be very strategic about the choices you make about what what you're going to focus on because there's always an un unbelievable need out there. And the reason why we focused on El Salvador was, I would say, threefold. Um, first of all, because of the Cold War, because essentially the U.S. government had propped up a corrupt military elite um, in El Salvador for, you know, uh, many, many, many years, but during the most acute period of state terror and repression from 1979 to the end of the conflict when there was a peace agreement in 1992. And the, you know, it sounds like, like chump change or whatever now to say that the U.S. was funding El Salvador to the tune of a million dollars a day. But at that point, and as Ray was saying, it was the third largest recipient of U.S. military aid after um, Israel and Egypt. And um, it was an incredible a incredibly important line in the sand was being drawn in El Salvador um, that was kind of a, um, you know, the most representative example of what the, how the Cold War was playing out in a particular uh, region. And I think all of us who had lived through that period had seen the devastation that had happened in El Salvador and knew a lot about it because we had been working with refugees from El Salvador felt a kind of very compelling sort of moral obligation to the region since it had been our country that had single-handedly been responsible essentially um, for propping up this regime which would never have been able to survive not just an armed conflict with a organized guerrilla force but you know uh, just would never have had the wherewithal basically um, to do to carry out to carry out what they carried out over the you know period of the conflict and the other thing was, of course, as I was referring to refugees, about a fifth of the population of El Salvador was displaced during that time, and many, many, many tens of hundreds of thousands of Salvadorans and Guatemalans came to the United States and were not received, you know, with open arms by any means. I was involved in one of the big uh, class action lawsuits of that time, which was called the American Baptist Churches versus Thornburg case. And in that case, which was defending sanctuary workers, I mean, that uh, uh, this whole history of sanctuary and the way in which it's sort of now been, common, you know, not starting to be understood as a concept um, because of what's happening with the current administration and its attempt to, you know, destroy the notion of sanctuary cities is that the sanctuary city movement came out of the sanctuary movement, which was a faith-based movement 
to protect Central American refugees from being forcibly returned to their country. In the 1980s, only less than 3% of Salvadorans were granted asylum, less than 1% of uh, Guatemalans were granted asylum. Arie worked on, when he was like way back in ACLU days or whatever, um, this amazing first, I remember this report, I think it was in 1982, which was the first report to try to look at what happened to Salvadorans when they were returned to their home country. And so all that history had happened. There was a you know huge community of people in the United States, of people who had been forced to flee the conflict. And then amongst them were the top commanders of the Salvadoran military. So it wasn't simply that there were, you know, commingled perpetrators, horrible and tragic for those communities, but in fact, all the top commanders essentially have been given refuge in the United States at the same time. And, um, and the third factor, of course, was what was going on in El Salvador, which was that um, after there was a peace agreement, there was a UN-sponsored truth commission. The UN-sponsored truth commission report came out on, I believe it was March 17th, 1993. I only remember that because it's my birthday. Um, and within five days on March 22nd, there was a, one of the broadest amnesties ever passed in any Latin American country or anywhere in the world. It was a blanket amnesty that basically protected anyone who had committed a human rights abuse during the conflict from criminal prosecution at home. And it wasn't really just that there was an amnesty, but it was also the kind of silencing and the end of any kind of discourse about the, Im the impact of this conflict and the abuses people had suffered and the torture that people had suffered and their continued disappeared relatives of which there were over 10,000 disappeared people. Um, but it was a direct reaction to the fact that the Truth Commission for El Salvador had named names. They had, they had organized the Truth Commission report around 32 exemplar crimes including the assassination of Archbishop Romero, the assassination of the six Jesuit priests, their housekeeper and her daughter, uh, the chill killing of the church women, um, the El Mazote massacre, the Rio Simple massacre, these kind of paradigmatic examples. And in the report, they had said who they thought they had sufficient evidence to um, find had been complicit, either directly or indirectly, as commanders in these crimes. So yeah, there, here is that like uh, the perfect storm from a like public interest perspective of here's a country where there is no opportunity, no opportunity for any kind of justice in country. Here's a country where a huge part of their population had been hemorrhaged out. Many of people had had come to the United States and been protected by you know faith-based communities, etc. And you know we had this role we the united states had this role to play in it so that's sort of the origin of that's like matt's origin story even though he wasn't actually at cja at the time this was all happening um and we really kind of did this thing which you know now 20 close to 20 years later you know it's it's there's sort of like a little cadre of people who you know go after some bad guy for like their whole life as a human rights lawyer um you know and i'm one of those people and reed brody has done that you know on the habre case and there's a few of us who just like keep after these certain bad guys year after year and it's a little hard in the current political climate to you know feel like oh why are you like mired in this past and like there's so much wretched stuff going on right now but there is a way in which this feeling, it sort of gets in your bones, you know, and you meet people along the way who were victims and survivors and you just remember their stories and they continue to motivate you. And of course, when I look at El Salvador today, you know, I see the, all the roots of everything that exists there now in terms of violence, gangs, et cetera, as very much rooted in the kind of institutions that were created by the military and their, paramilitary collaborators is sort of springing up in different forms. Um, so anyway, the, the case that, you know, Matt will talk about was, is, was very much part of like a deep commitment that kind of kept snowballing and morphing into different things and trying to have a very holistic approach to the work. Uh, there were, you know, three different lawsuits that we were involved in, all of which we were successful. 
Um, and we, we, after those cases, we then, you know, started lobbying the previously uh, Immigration Naturalization Service, now Department of Homeland Security, for many, many years to deport um, the, you know, subjects of our litigation. We've succeeded in getting and working with Department of Homeland Security, hard to imagine, but it did happen, um, to get the two top military commanders of El Salvador, the Minister of Defense from 1979 to 83 and the Minister of Defense from 83 to 89, deported back to El Salvador. And um, and so it's you know it's morphed in different directions and using U.S. forums now and using the Spanish uh, Spanish National Court as a forum for a case on the Jesuit massacre. I'm not going to go into any of like the case details, but I'm happy to talk about it later. But anyway, that's sort of the broad context in which now uh, you know Matt's work um, on the Romero assassination sort of fits. And Matt, I'd, I'd like you to talk about uh, that and about the book, but Patty, I want to come back to you um, on the question, and I'll give you notice uh, now. Uh, aside from uh, sheer persistence, um, you know, I'd like you to talk about what you see as the value of pursuing these cases mm -hmm. so many years um, after the, uh, the crimes took place. Any anyway, rate, Matt, would you like me to talk about that now or let, let Matt okay. talk about uh, okay, great. The, the, and yes, then we'll I'll come back to that. Definitely be very happy to come back to that. Um, yeah, so it, it, this is um, well. I'll start by thanking everybody up here. Thank you, Ari, for for hosting us, and uh, and Ray and and Patty for being here with us. And there are many people in the audience to thank as well. Sandy Colliver for all your help, and many others who are here. Um, it, it's it, it's great to follow Patty uh, in part because Patty was uh, not only a trailblazer in the work that I later got to join, uh, but also in, in helping me craft that story for the book as well to to sort of put that put the Romero case in in the context of the other work that was going on at CJA and and elsewhere. Um, the the Romero case is, is is interesting in some ways because um, because the result of the case and I uh, we can get into all the details but the the trials uh, that CJ did about El Salvador that bookended the Romero case were in some ways um, uh, perhaps the the direct impact of those cases was perhaps stronger uh, because you had uh, you know the defendants uh, you know essentially in the dock I guess you could say um, and and we had jury verdicts against the top commanders uh, in in the Salvadoran military the Romero case was in some ways both more limited and and more expansive and what I mean by more limited is that um, you know the the story that I tell in the book uh, is, is partly about the case that we built against Alvaro Saravia for his role in murdering Archbishop Romero. Um, but in fact, the investigation that we were that we did and that we were trying to do was much broader than that, but that is not what came out at, at trial for a number of reasons that it, I won't go into right now, but that we talk about, that I talk about in the book. And the, so the Romero trial itself had, um, was perhaps, uh, a bit more limited compared to some of these other cases. Um, but the investigation and the broader story of Romero uh, is, is so much wider, and that was actually part of why I did want to write the book. Um, we, there was a lot of evidence that, that we came across, but there was so much evidence that predated any of the work that we ever did at CJA. Um, and, and I what I felt was important in the book was to be able to explain some of that uh, either to people who had forgotten it or never knew it in the first place and to talk about the work of so many people on on the assassination of Archbishop Romero and on investigating that and on reporting on that um, that and to put that all into one place and and lay all of it out um, that was something that I felt particularly when we launched uh, the investigation at CJA or when, when I guess when my piece of it came around, um, 
was was something that was was quite impressive to behold um starting from uh, the day of Romero's assassination and Judge Atilio Ramirez Amaya attempting to investigate that before three days later suffering his own assassination attempt and having to flee the country for the next 10 years. All the way through um, the reporting of Salvadoran reporters, of U.S. reporters, of, of many others, uh, through U.S. Embassy officials, um, through the Truth Commission, and on and on. And the, the body of evidence is... Um, was impressive uh, and, and, and stunning before we even came to the case. So what we attempted to do with the case, I think, was try to bring as, as broad a picture as we could to the Romero assassination uh, and, and bring all of that evidence together and build from there. Um, so the case, you know, the, the, the way that I talk about it in, in the book was that we saw um, – our obligation as we had we had one person alvaro sarabia who was present in the united states who we knew was involved in archbishop romero's assassination and that was in some ways the hook uh to then build the case from there we had a lawsuit directly against sarabia um but sarabia was one of many people involved and so it was the way to attempt to hold somebody accountable in a U.S. court for Romero's assassination. But we always saw our, our, um, our strategy as being who was a, a looking at who was above Sarabia, essentially. And so when we filed the lawsuit, Sarabia was named as a defendant, but we also named does 1 through 10. And we intended those does to be anybody who was above Sarabia, namely uh, people who financed uh, the death squad that Sarabia was a member of, Roberto Davison's death squad, and trying to get at those who were higher up, who were involved uh, either in the murder or at least in supporting Davison's uh, death squad in a way that might bring legal responsibility. And we saw that as, uh, as a focus for our investigation for the next year. A big part of why I wrote the book was because at the end of the day, we didn't end up naming anybody else as a defendant in the case. And the trial was only against Alvaro Saravia. There are a number of reasons for that, which I can go into if people, people want. But I felt like there, was, there is a significant body of evidence out there, both evidence that existed before our case and then some witness information that we uh, came across in doing our own investigation. And I wanted to put as much of that on the record as I was able to do, and there's still a lot that I was not able to include in the book. Um, but I wanted to try to lay out um, what's been publicly discussed, what uh, is perhaps been confidentially uh, out in the ether for a number of years, and what were some of the things that we came across in our own investigation. And, and and tracking our attempt to investigate the financiers or, or military higher-ups uh, who might have been implicated in, in Romero's assassination. So, uh, so that's a theme that runs through the book, is that part of that investigation, which in fact never really ended up in court and never ended up in the public realm. Um, maybe just to say um, a, a few things that I think came out of the Romero case um, that, that perhaps are important, and, and Patty can certainly speak to, to this <coughs> as well. Um, you know, I do think the trial itself, um, with the limits that it had, um, did have, was important for a few reasons. First of all, it is the only uh, verdict in any court ever for the, about the assassination of Archbishop Romero. Uh, and I do think that's important. The judge, um, our judge, who was a, a, a Reagan appointee and a former U.S. Marine, um, and and treated the case uh, very seriously but fairly, um, you know, concluded that Roberto Davison uh, was the mastermind of of the assassination, and that's I think an important uh, that was an important uh, conclusion, particularly at the time given the the political situation in El Salvador. 
um, we have a court verdict against one of the central figures in Roberto Davison's group. I think that's important, uh, and particularly coming from a, a U.S. federal court. Uh, we, we had the testimony of the getaway driver, Amado Garay, under oath uh, in open court, testifying about Saravia's role in the assassination, uh, his links with, uh, or Garay's links with Roberto Davison in the death squad, um, and that, that's all under oath in open court. The, uh, one of the things that I, uh, that I document uh, toward the end of the book is the, the chain of events from the, the trial in our case through the next six years, essentially, where um, Saravia, our defendant, um, ended up making many important disclosures, culminating uh, eventually in 2010 uh, in Carlos Dada's uh, fantastic uh, article in El Faro, um, which was uh, the result of extensive interviews with, with Saravia, and frankly, I think gives us the best record we're probably going to get of the, the basics of, of the assassination. And I think that that's an important, um, that's been an important uh, product uh, of all the work that came before it. Um, and, and I do think, and, and maybe Patty can, can comment on this later, um, I do think that the time that the Romero case came through, it did help to continue building the credibility of, of CJA and of doing these cases um, in the United States the, the case against the two former ministers of defense had come before and clearly was the critical um, piece in, in helping us then continue with additional cases. But I do think that the Romero case coming after that on an, um, such an important figure like Archbishop Romero on such a, a difficult investigation, uh, I do think was, uh, was important then in, in being able to continue that work on I mean, Patty would have kept going with it regardless of whether we had, had, that, uh, had that backing or not. But I, I do think that that was uh, an important um, effect of the case as well. So I'll, uh, I'll stop talking there and okay. can get into some other things. And, and if I could just uh, add a word uh, to what you had to say about the, uh, the importance of having uh, a judicial finding with respect to, uh, to Daubuisson. Daubuisson, as, uh, aside from being a death squad leader, uh, was the founder of the Arena Political Party, and this was the political party which um, uh, adopted the uh, the amnesty law five days after the uh, the Truth Commission report, and the Arena Political Party has continued to be a uh, major uh, factor um, forming governments uh, in El Salvador. So, uh, demonstrating that its uh, founder. Uh, was uh, the assassin, and doing that in court has uh, uh, extra significance. Uh, if I can come back to the, the question I want to uh, ask Patty, and I'd uh, ask uh, Ray and, and Matt also to comment on this. Um, uh, what is the importance, uh, as far as you are concerned, uh, of um, holding um, accountable those who have been responsible for these kinds of crimes so many years um, after the crimes uh, took place, aside from uh, the sense of satisfaction uh, for the, um, uh, the lawyers pursuing the cases or even for the, um, the families of, of the victims, uh, what do you see as the, uh, uh, the value of this? You know, this is, and Arye has written extensively about this in, in all kinds of, you know, locations, including the New York Review of Books, et cetera, are sort of how you think about these cases and what kind of claims are fair to make about their impact. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of sort of basic ideas about justice, about, you know, a courtroom as a place for truth, et cetera. And I think that I don't want to overclaim what they're, what they what they open up, but I think that um, El Salvador is a really good example in some ways, especially now with the uh, Salvadoran Supreme Court decision overturning the amnesty law. 
um, of a place that because there was so little possibility for real dialogue in the country that these these lawsuits which took place with all the like formal imprimatur of US justice were very important to a process within El Salvador of constantly sort of pushing open the door and I know Matt certainly doesn't want to claim that he's like personally responsible for Romero becoming a saint it is true however that the case and um, and and writing about the case afterwards and continuing to talk about it was a factor among many many factors that were kind of part of a whole mix that was going on inside and outside El Salvador um, around sort of remembrance, uh, keeping the memory alive of the people who were victims, and really also having these very important figures like Romero and the Jesuit priests who were killed in the service of humanity. Um, and um, and so there there has been, I think, a real you know kind of snowball effect to some extent. And I just want to go back with one little anecdote, which is that prior to doing the case uh, against uh, Generals Garcia and Vitas Casanova, there had been another case on uh, concerning the church women's assassination in which, uh, unfortunately, Garcia and uh, Vitas Casanova had not been found liable for that assassination. And there was a huge amount of skepticism and pessimism in El Salvador about like, why are you people doing this in US courts? And like, this is just not going anywhere. And if anything, it's vindicating these guys and it's more of the same. And after um, the lawsuit that I was involved in against these same two generals on behalf of three victims of torture, and we prevailed in that case, I went down to El Salvador and um, it was really unbelievable my experience there. Literally everywhere I went, I was taken around by a priest named John Cortina, who um, was a friend of Romero's and a very important sort of part of the uh, liberation theology group in um, a priest in El Salvador. And he was just, I don't know, took me under his wing or whatever, um, and was shepherding me around to various meetings with women's groups, with victims groups, with the organization he had founded, Pro Buscada, which tries to reunite, and continues to try to reunite children who were um, kidnapped essentially in El Salvador and adopted out of El Salvador with their families in El Salvador. And everywhere I went, all anybody wanted to do was tell me their stories. Every place, like if I was in a lobby of a of a, you know, somewhere at the University of Central America, people would just come up to me and want to tell me about what happened. And I felt like this was just a thing that people felt like they couldn't really talk about before. And here was this lawyer from the United States coming down to, to talk about the case and tell everybody what happened. And it just sort of like tapped into this vein um, that obviously had only been, you know, scabbed over, but was really there, which was, you know, how to get any kind of accountability for what happened. And so I feel like the courtroom did become, and we could have probably used it, done it better, you know, in terms of how we, I mean, there were times and we'd be in a courtroom and there'd be like four people in the audience or whatever, and we'd be going like, nobody even knows what we're doing, you know? Um, and there could could have been better ways probably for us to to try to bring more people into the process. But I think that, you know, in terms of a, sort of all the indices of what you look at for why this is important, you know, how it affects victims, how it, it redounds in the home country, the so-called Pinochet effect, um, the, uh, you know, just opportunity for some court to make a recognition of the liability and responsibility of key actors. Um, using the court as a place to get at at least some part of the full story, to elaborate the story. I mean, I think one of the things that's so impressive about Matt's book is that it really shows you the texture of these investigations that have to happen to do these cases. And there are very, very few vehicles that really show that in a way that you actually want to read <coughs> and are really interested in, but also to enlarge this fuller truth about what happened with Romero and to even though it couldn't necessarily be brought in the courtroom, we were f discovering it 
through the work that we did and through the investigation that was carried out. So I think there are the multiplicity of vectors that are kind of the classic ones that people, you know, who, who write about and think about this stuff were have been fulfilled to some extent. I, as I say, I don't want to overclaim, you know, no, the, well, no, there's one guy sitting in jail, um, <laughs> okay. a former vice minister of defense of El Salvador, uh, Montano is, you know, to, to some extent through the work that, or through a large extent, I want to take credit for that, uh, that CJ has done on the Jesuit massacre case. This is a guy who's been incarcerated for close to four years now in a U.S. jail. Um, it's a complicated story, which I can explain if anybody wants to hear it. But um, so it's not really about criminal justice per se, but it is about having a court and having a judge and having a jury proclaim a finding that can reverberate, um, you know, most importantly back in the home country, but elsewhere. Ray, do you want to uh, come in on this? I'm not sure I have a lot to add. I guess as I think about it, there is, I think there's a, an effect on it. You'll never see it directly, but look, I think a lot of, thugs, dictators, call them what you will, human rights abusers around the world are probably aware of these cases. And they know that it, you, you're not going to get away with it maybe in the United States. And I, you know, I can't, I, I remember in, when I was in Bosnia arguing, uh, you know, we need to set up, that was before the court was set up, you know, there needs to be a court to try some of these people. And, and I think there's a, you know, RA, which you, of course, dedicated your whole life to, and that's building up this concept of there's going to be some kind of a legal system that, that deals with these people. And I think every case probably is an accretion, if you will, and it kind of getting across this idea that there is kind of a larger system of justice and the ICC and, and the places like that. So I, 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 I'm sure this resonates. I'm not sure how many African dictators and thugs have, have read about this case, but I'm sure more than you realize. And they probably think, you know, maybe it's not so safe to go to the United States. Yeah, although I would say that, that when uh, a court imposed a 50-year sentence on Charles Taylor, that resonated with quite a lot of uh, African political leaders. Matt? Yeah, maybe I'll just add one, one more point. Certainly, Patty has said it very well. Um, uh, with all the cases, but particularly, I think, with the Romero case, uh, of course, uh, you know, this was not being done in the United States in, in isolation, right? This, this was something that our Salvadoran colleagues um, wanted to see done and wanted to see done seriously. Um, obviously, we have a, a panel of, of people from the United States tonight, but, but this was all being done in, in uh, absolute arm in arm um, with people in El Salvador who, of course, uh, face a lot more danger and uncertainty than than anything we we ever face, and uh, there was um, you know there and I, I do include a few conversations in the book um, you know about the interest in looking at the United States as a venue um, you know to be able to push these kinds of cases forward and particularly on Archbishop Romero's case uh, you had the amnesty law in full effect at that time. Uh, and when there actually had been attempts in the in the 80s to to try and do something, those were scuttled uh, by Dobbison and others. So there, um, you know, I think particularly in the Romero case, there there was a strong interest um, among uh, you know human rights experts in El Salvador to see a case like this um, proceed in in the United States. And and so I think that uh, that maybe ties in a little bit with with what Patty was saying there. So I just wanted to add that point. Uh, before we uh, open it up for uh, questions, um, what do you anticipate uh, as a result of the um, decision of the uh, Salvadoran Supreme Court uh, to invalidate the, uh, the amnesty law? Uh, can we now uh, expect that there might be um, some uh, late in the day prosecutions uh, in El Salvador itself? Probably getting the question, so I'm curious hearing your answer. 
uh, yeah, I, uh, I mean, I think there are probably people in this room who can, who uh, may be able to answer that better than I can. I'll, I'll speak to, well, I'll give you, I'll give you the line that, that I've been using, but I would be very interested to hear uh, uh, Patty and Ray's take and also uh, others to perhaps uh, continue the conversation. Um, and in fact, I think Patty and I had a, had a conversation about this. My book was going into production and I had, you know, written a, a bit of a conclusion talking about the amnesty law still being in effect. And then it was, and then it was uh, invalidated. And I had to figure out very quickly what I wanted to say about that. Um, and, uh, and Patty and I talked and I think Patty said, I think you're a little too pessimistic. Let's not forget that there have been times when you know there's a crack in the ice and, and things do proceed. Certainly several years ago, many of us were talking about Guatemala and that nothing was ever going to happen there. And lo and behold, imperfect as it's been, there have been uh, you know, some cases in, in Guatemala. So I do think, uh, you know, look, you've got the reopening of the El Mosote case. I think that there is, there is optimism that some of these cases can start to start to slowly move along. Um, I'm I'm less optimistic um, with Archbishop Romero's case. First of all, because at least so far, I don't know of any particular movement on that. I think it's a case that requires um, even more political will than perhaps some of the other cases because of the political uh, issue with the arena party but also because um if you follow the romero assassination to uh, what i think is its logical end you are implicating extremely powerful people in el salvador um and i know in military cases you might be doing the same but here we are talking about um you know early members of the arena party very wealthy families uh in el salvador and i think that it is um it is going to be difficult for anybody to have the political will uh, or to generate enough uh, support to push that forward. So I'm, I'm less optimistic on, on Archbishop Romero's case. That being said, certainly it's helpful that he's soon going to be named a saint. And um, perhaps that can be a, a bit of a groundswell. But I will say, you know, I, I will be, I'm extremely cautiously optimistic, but I'm also on, on the Romero case myself not, not holding my breath at this moment. Patty, do you want to uh, add to that? Well, I mean, I don't have too much to add other than to say that, um, you know, I think what what I'm trying to learn from this experience and what's going on in El Salvador now is that um, the civil society organizations were so completely decimated um, by state repression. And it's taken a long time for the civil society organizations to reconstitute themselves. And what I'm seeing now is this younger generation of, of young lawyers, I mean, you know, people in their early to mid 30s who are taking up the gauntlet of what they refer to as the historic crimes. And they're people who are working every day on prison conditions and police brutality and everything else that's going on in El Salvador, but they have this kind of really, you know, in their hearts place for what, you know, they heard about and know about through their own families. And so they're picking up the gauntlet, but they're incredibly under-resourced, incredibly understaffed. I mean, to think that the lawyers would play the kind of role that civil society organizations have been playing in Guatemala in really pushing um, forward cases the way that it is possible in a civil law system is a little inconceivable without more infusion of resources because we know what it takes to do one of these cases and for El Mazote which is the biggest massacre that occurred during the conflict and even the most uh, forensically you know there was uh, exhumation of the mass grave sites and forensic evidence etc still is a gargantuan task and so my feeling is that, you know, those of us who've sort of like walked alongside um, the people who were the victims when, you know, during the conflict, it like behooves us to support these young lawyers who were trying to take up the gauntlet, but with like, you know, a arm tied behind their backs, basically, in terms of the resources and, and access they have to be able to really press these cases um, properly. So 
um, you know, in, it, I do think it's something that's going to have to come from people really making it happen. It is not the FMLN government is not going to willingly just be like, oh, the law, you know, the amnesty law was overturned, so let's forge ahead. Um, it's going to have to be the civil society organizations and lawyers and, you know, inside, outside collaborations or whatever that are going to just keep pressing maybe these exemplar cases that are, uh, you know, I, I, El Mazote in particular, I think because of the nature of the crime and the massiveness of the crime, but also to, quite frankly, because the Minister of Defense of El Salvador at the time, uh, Guillermo Garcia, was one of the subjects of our litigation, was deported back to El Salvador about a year ago, and he is the person who, you know, said that the whole crime was made up, then blamed it on the FMLN in a sort of classic pattern of deception and cover up, and he's there now, you know. So the actual person, in my mind, who has to be held accountable for that crime is in El Salvador. So, um, but, you know, just, trying to be a realist, you know, I think that people are going to need a lot of support and a lot of help, uh, you know, from civil society and funders and whatever in the U.S. to, to make this happen so that they have the capacity to, to really, you know, push these cases. I, I just wanted to very quickly add to what Patty said about resources, which is such, such an important point to make here. Um, you know, in, in, in our case, in the Romero case, we had a basically a one-year full court press uh, on this case, and uh, you know some of the things that had been written about the book called us a ragtag team of lawyers. Well, maybe inside CJ's offices we were a bit ragtag, but in fact we had a powerful team. Aside from everybody in El Salvador we were working with, we were teamed up with one of the biggest law firms in the United States. We were working with Jim Mintz and his wonderful investigation a uh, team who was working pro bono. We had an enormous, powerful team working on this case. And in the end, we still didn't end up naming any of the other defendants that we wanted to name in the case. And, and so I, I just wanted to add that is to, in thinking about the resources, I think is such a crucial thing in addition to all the other uh, challenges that there are. Uh, El Masonte, I don't know if you get Garcia, but I think there's probably a couple of colonels or majors out there you could probably get on your way up to the top that would have a very salutary effect. Uh, and I, I, w I don't think I'd go after Garcia. You, you know who they are. We know who they are. Yeah. They're there, and I think you could get those with the kind of work you've done fairly easily. Okay, uh, I'm going to open it up, um, but uh, before I do, uh, I'm supposed to uh, remind you that uh, if you uh, speak up, um, you will be recorded, and we will uh, do something with the, uh, the recording, so uh, be aware that you're uh, giving up your privacy to a degree if you uh, take part in the, in the conversation. And uh, if you uh, want to ask a question, there's a microphone uh, on my right uh, in the, uh, the front of the room. And if you'd uh, go to, uh, to that microphone and identify yourself, uh, and um, uh, we, can, we can take comments, but not too lengthy uh, comments uh, as well as questions. Go ahead. My name's Kate Doyle, and I'm with the National Security Archive. First of all, Matt, terrific book. You managed to sort of get this tease of a thriller, as well as the anatomy of uh, government-supported death squad operations, and that's a very, very hard thing to depict, and it's wonderfully told in your book. So congratulations. Thank you. I want to challenge you guys a tiny bit on the sort of limited answers you gave to Arye's question about what do you think, why does this matter um, to, to chase after dictators and human rights abusers and find them accountable even 10, 20, or 30 years later? I mean, it, this, is, this is a comment, but open for your reactions. One thing you didn't mention is your, your, your both training and um, Animando, how do you say that? Uh, giving enthusiasm to uh, exciting, encouraging young lawyers who work in human rights. Yes, in El Salvador, but 
in the United States. I know young lawyers from CAJA have gone on to illustrious careers in Canada. Matt is someone <laughs> sitting at the table. The you know, and not just focusing on Latin America cases, Absolutely. but but cases of all kinds. Um, Almudena Bernabeu, who's, who's working through a new organization in Spain. I mean, I think one of the things that these cases do over time is build up this incredible kind of infrastructure of knowledge and experience that is passed down through human rights law clinics and law schools and, and law interns and, and all kinds of people uh, who then go on and, and, and spread the word and spread the good deed. And uh, that, I think, is why it's worth continuing these kinds of cases you know, until we drop. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have a comment or a reaction, but I just wanted to say that. Uh, reaction uh, to that. Um, I, I derive uh, my own thinking on, on this uh, to a significant extent from a book that a German philosopher, uh, Karl Jaspers, uh, wrote in the, uh, the aftermath of uh, World War II. Uh, the book in, in German is Die Schuldfrage, uh, The Guilt Question, and it's translated into uh, to English as the question of, of German guilt. Um, and um, uh, Jaspers uh, argues that, um, that criminal guilt uh, is uh, individual and uh, you can only uh, deal with it on an individual basis and you have to um, uh, hold accountable those uh, who are criminally um, guilty. But he also talks about uh, various other forms of guilt, and one of those forms of guilt is um, a political guilt. Uh, and he says that's collective. He says um, that uh, a society as a whole um, uh, allows um, certain things to, uh, to take place, and no one um, uh, in um, uh, contemporary society is a hermit, uh, living in the mountains, all of us ha take some part uh, in the political process. And that we have to come uh, to grips um, with uh, our um, participation to the degree that we have allowed um, these kinds of, of crimes to take place. Uh, and in order to do that, um, we have to g g engage in an, an acknowledgement um, of uh, the, uh, the crimes. Uh, and it's important that the, uh, the whole society should take part um, in uh, the acknowledgement of, that, uh, of the crimes. And if one wants to build uh, a society with uh, democratic responsibility uh, in the aftermath uh, of um, uh, these uh, terrible things, uh, that um, process uh, of acknowledgement um, uh, needs to, uh, to take place. Uh, in fact, I think um, Jaspers uh, had a big effect eventually uh, in Germany, and perhaps uh, more than in any other country, uh, there has been a, a kind of collective um, acceptance uh, of responsibility uh, in Germany for the, um, uh, the crimes uh, of the, um, uh, the Nazi uh, era. And uh, I, I believe that the, um, the democratic process uh, in Germany, uh, perhaps as exemplified by uh, Angela Merkel uh, and uh, her policies um, with uh, respect to, uh, to refugees and her international policies uh, generally, reflects uh, that kind of German um, uh, acknowledgement uh, of the, um, uh, the political responsibility uh, for the, uh, the crimes of the Nazi era. It was, uh, Angela Merkel wasn't alive uh, at the time the, uh, the Nazi uh, crimes were committed, but she still feels uh, a kind of political responsibility as uh, a German um, to, uh, to acknowledge those crimes and behave in a uh, democratic uh, fashion. Uh, and so uh, from my standpoint, uh, if a society um, which has uh, had as much uh, criminality uh, as took place uh, in uh, El Salvador 
uh, in uh, the uh, the 1980s uh, is to uh, to develop uh, as a decent society. Uh, there has to be uh, that uh, collective acknowledgement, and to have uh, wealthy families uh, still today uh, as the uh, the elite of El Salvador who had a role in. Uh, making it possible for the uh, the actual killers uh, to engage in these kinds of crimes. If that kind of a society uh, is to be uh, transformed, uh, there needs to be uh, the uh, the process uh, of facing up to uh, the um, uh, the terrible things that uh, that did happen uh, in that country. And from my standpoint, pursuing. Uh, these kinds of things very long afterwards uh, is justified uh, first and foremost uh, by the need to try to, um, uh, to transform uh, a society of, of that sort. At any rate, um, if anybody wants to challenge that, I'm happy to, uh, <laughs> uh, to hear it. Go ahead. Uh, Jim Mintz, uh, my uh, investigative firm played a uh, microscopic role in the story that uh, Matt's book tells so well. And um, I wanted to focus on the investigative aspects of, uh, of the story uh, you tell. I think the investigation was uh, fascinating and, and excellent, and I, and I think you tell it in a fascinating and excellent way. Um, so I guess it, is, it stands for uh, a, a, a point uh, that's important to me, uh, that, that human rights work is, is largely investigative work. Uh, and I've always viewed uh, CJA uh, and Human Rights Watch and others as basically investigative organizations, um, and to the extent you guys are also lawyers, you're investigative lawyers, and to the extent Ray is a reporter, he's an investigative reporter. And, um, and so I guess my question is what uh, do you feel you've learned or what should we learn as investigative human rights activists uh, that we can take to other uh, human rights situations about the investigative aspect? <laughs> just full disclosure, I, I work for Jim or with Jim <coughs> teaching a course, an investigative course at Columbia, you know, the, J the journalism school. But as you're asking a question, I mean, I'm thinking about El Masote, of course, which everybody brings up, <coughs> and when I reported about that. Uh, sure, because I guess it relates the answer. I mean, <clears throat> I'm, I'm assuming you all know what El Masote is. No. Well, it was a massacre. It was a massacre in El Salvador, and the full circle. It's what brought the attacks on me that that Ari referred to a while ago. I was a reporter in in El Salvador. <clears throat> I'd been a lawyer like these guys, and had dropped out. Uh, didn't know what I was going to do with my life, and went down to Central America. And as I say, I got to El Salvador on, on Sunday, and the nuns were killed on Tuesday, and the rest is history. And the New York Times started letting me write for them, much to their later regret. Um, and I don't know, when was it December or whatever it was, I was down there, and I wanted to go in with the guerrillas. Um, naturally, you would. I mean, it's, you know. Um, Morrison right. But the important thing is, is, as a journalist, I wanted to go in with the guerrillas. Now, you know, that later that brought accusations that you're a guerrilla sympathizer. Come on, it was the biggest story around. 
we were expending, as Patty pointed out, more money there than any, any other country with the exception of Israel and Egypt. Naturally, as a reporter, you want to go in and find out what's, who are we fighting? What it's, what's it about? Who are, the, who are these Marxist guerrillas? Have they been to Cuba? So I went, you know, I tried. Every journalist wanted to go in, and uh, because I had the imprimatur of the New York Times, obviously, um, the guerrillas arranged for me to go in, along with Susan Micellis, uh, who was a terrific photojournalist, of course. All of you know her work. And we went, and then I, because I was a young, naive journalist at the time, I called a, a friend of mine, Alma Guillermo Prieto, who was at the Washington Post. People have said to me, you called a competitor to tell her you were going in? I did, and I'm glad I did for obvious reasons that will become obvious later. Anyhow, we went in. We went in with the guerrillas. We did not know about the massacre. How did you get to know what's on the phone? Well, I, I had dinner with Susan the other night. We were talking about it, and we were trying to remember. We went to a hotel. It was at Christmas time, and we were here, and I got the call, and you can go, and we went to Honduras, and then we took a car out of Honduras and the first night you know we were supposed to meet somebody on the road and they didn't show up and so we had to do it again and then we went across I, mean, I remember this going across a river with my backpack over my head and a full moon and I thought this is either romantic part of me thought it was pretty romantic like backpacking in the Sierras which I'd done the other part of me brought back a memories of Vietnam where I had been a marine thinking my god am I setting up for a, a sniper attack with that full moon and we went in, and we were, you know, eventually, and I still don't remember, or Susan remembers better, how many days we were in there traveling around in guerrilla-held territory, interviewing all kinds of people. I mean, this was a real, journalistically, this was a scoop. This was an incredible opportunity. And remember, there were no sat, there were no, not even sat phones, so I had to, it was well after I had been in and gotten out before I could write the story. And we were taken to this village where, where, you know, we saw this the, the horrors, and it was really, really horrible. I, I mean, I still, I can still see it. I can see the, the, the spilled coffee beans and a peasant lying there and children's toys under the huts and in the. Houses that had been collapsed, and the bodies, and the bones. It was horrific. It was pretty horrible. It was pretty clear something had happened. So when I got out, because again, oh, you couldn't, you couldn't write about it from inside. When I got out, I wrote about it, and it was on the front page of the New York Times, and that's when the Reagan administration, as well as the Salvadoran, said it never happened, there hadn't been a massacre, and besides that, no, not this number of people have been killed, and besides that, it, and this was, and then the Wall Street Journal said this was a propaganda exercise, and I was a reporter out on a limb. Um, well, a few days after <laughs> uh, the story appeared, uh, there was a migrant rescue <laughs> theory. There, there was a Con congressional hearing a few days after, and uh, I was uh, one of the witnesses scheduled to testify at the um, uh, hearing, and uh, uh, the, uh, the people who preceded me were the administration spokespersons. Um, Tom Enders was the, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Inter-American Affairs, and Elliot Abrams was the, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Human Rights. And they preceded me um, on the, uh, the witness stand and essentially said uh, it never happened, that this had talked about uh, so many people uh, being killed. There weren't so many people who lived in this village uh, in the first instance. They ignored the fact that it, uh, it involved several different uh, hamlets uh, and not just the, uh, the one hamlet uh, known as El Mazote, and in a variety of ways uh, they conveyed the impression uh, that it never took place. And at that stage, um, I had the, um, the stories uh, that Ray had written for the New York Times and that Alma had written uh, for uh, the, uh, the Washington Post, uh, but we had not ourselves uh, been to the place, didn't have um, uh, independent uh, information um, on uh, the case at that time. And so 
uh, I feel I was rather weaker uh, than I should have been in rebutting uh, the, uh, the testimony of, uh, of Enders and Abrams at that time. Um, I, I will uh, tell one story, which may, maybe I shouldn't tell, but I will tell it anyway. Uh, and that is, uh, I, ha I had started with a friendly relationship with, uh, with Elliot Abrams, which uh, deteriorated over a period of time. And one day he called me uh, to yell at me about one of um, Ray Bonner's um, stories. And then he signed off the phone conversation um, in a way uh, that was uh, quite unexpected. Uh, he said, I wish I could say the same about El Mazote. Yeah. Um, any rate. But, you know, but Jim, back, it wasn't really investigative reporting as, you know, I've heard you teaching it to these kids <laughs> and very, very effectively. I mean, I just went, I was just doing basic reporting. And, you'd, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to go interview the military or et cetera. It's obviously I asked the government for a comment, et cetera. But it, it's these, these are the guys that really do the deep, deep, deep digging into these stories. And, but at that time, I think R.A. Nair was, I didn't know R.A. at that time. I'd met him, I think it was shortly after that. He was, Human Rights Watch was R.A. Nair, one of the, Cynthia Brown, was it? Or yeah. The secretary. Three, that was what th Human Rights Watch was in. Three people in an office. Uh, now look at it today. Um. I just wanted to add a little bit on the investigation end because I think it's a really, really important. And I think, I, I don't know how many times, you know, we sat around a table going like, we need an investigator, we need an investigator. You know, you guys, and and then otherwise it was us. And we were sort of like, oh my God, we're the investigators, but we're also the lawyers, you know, investigator, lawyer, investigator, lawyer. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things I feel like, you know, I've been privileged to sort of reflect on all this stuff so much over the years is that it's really important to think about this stuff forensically and, you know, how it is going to be used in a case is different from other ways in which you might treat evidence, um, be it actual forensic ev evidence from a, you know, crime scene or be other forms of forensic evidence, and also just trying to think creatively about what is evidence. So we we have been in a situation throughout all the work that we've done where we have no cachet of documents from El Salvador. We have very, very few Salvadorans who have, you know, bro broken the code of silence um, and um, that every military person was trained in, you know, you scratch each other's back and all the way up the chain of command. And um, so we haven't been in that situation. And one of the things, just to pick back up on, you know, Kate's question, and thank you very much, because of course, as a, you know, professor um, and a lawyer, you know, that's a, a huge part of it for me is educating the next generation or next generations now, I guess, um, is that um, we ended up using US government declassified documents thank you National Security Archive. And we worked with amazing people, including Kate, at National Security Archives throughout the process and, and, and to actually though, the problem is you're sort of retrofitting this amazing cache of information from the US government, but you're having to do it in this way where you're not really indicting the US government for its role because the US's role is irrelevant, quote unquote, to the evidence in your case. So you're having to figure out how do I take what I've learned from literally tens of thousands of documents that, you know, Matt, me, Ken, other people like, you know, scoured um, for purposes of litigation and make it understandable to a judge and a jury. And that, that whole process has been a kind of an amazing thing, but also just to think about it as evidence for a trial, evidence that you're gonna be able to bring into court. So I think that there's the whole, all the questions embedded in sort of how you carry out investigations, what you're trying to find, but also how you have to think about it as an actual piece of evidence that's gonna be admitted into a court of law, um, make, you know, just complicate it. And, um, and sometimes having both the hats at the same time, you know, is not s such an easy 
you know, thing to carry within yourself. There are many conversations I can remember where we like wanted to, especially around this issue of the U.S.'s role, you know, where we would be like, we can't do these cases and not be talking about the U.S.'s role. We can't, you know, and then it would be like, but we're not going to be able to talk about the U.S. role, and then what's that going to do, and how's that going to affect a jury in 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005? This is a time after 9-11, and we had to be very conscious of how a jury was going to interpret a story, the narrative of which on the other side is we were fighting terrorism. And I was recently going back and looking at a transcript from one of our cases, and I was like, baffled at how many times the defendant in his testimony had used the word terrorist. And, you know, that language was appropriated, so we had to, you know, figure our way around that. So the investigation evidence paradigm, you know, and where they are on the ends of the spectrum, I think is, is something we still could learn a lot more about and need to be talking more about and writing more about so that, you know, we can be teaching future generations about how to think about it. I'm Leonora Arteaga, I'm Salvadorian, and I work at the Due Process of Law Foundation, DPLF, a human rights organization based in UC. And before that, I work at ProBusqueda and Tutela Legal, and I've been um, dealing with all the impunity struggle in El Salvador for, for a long time now. And I really want to thank you, um, Mark, for your excellent book and also for bringing light uh, to this case and this uh, figure, uh, a leader for not only for Salvadorian people but from the world and all, all the, the previous work that you have done, Patty, and of course uh, Raymond Bonner is an honor to meet all of you. And I, I completely agree with what you were saying about um, uh, the um, challenges that uh, civil society is facing now and victims groups in El Salvador because they have um, lost uh, their capacity to have like a really big impact, their lack of resources, of human resources, financial resources, they don't have any fresh ideas anymore. But at the same time, after the, the um, decision on the amnesty law, uh, there's like a renewed uh, interest and the agenda has been moving. Uh, the El Mozote case, uh, the criminal investigation on El Mozote case was reopened, but also another case, uh, another massacre, the El Calabozo massacre. And recently the Attorney General uh, finally had created a special unit for investigating uh, historic cases. Uh, he doesn't really know how to do it, but at least <laughs> he has created this uh, special uh, unit. So um, definitely there's a new, a new moment in El Salvador. And there's also a discussion on how to search people uh, that disappeared during the war. There's a commission that will be uh, set up soon. Um, but at the same time, El Salvador, as, as probably everybody here knows, is facing with uh, really high uh, rates of crime and uh, has like a really bad uh, economy. Uh, so the, the the social space for discussing and debating uh, the issues that happened 30 years ago is really small. And I would like uh, a comment from you on how to engage uh, society in general now uh, taking into account this uh, context uh, that uh, gives, it looks like it gives really small space uh, for the historical agenda. It's a very difficult uh, question. Um, the one thing that I would uh, say is that I don't think the, uh, the difficulties of uh, El Salvador today are 
um, unconnected uh, to the, uh, the history uh, of uh, El Salvador. Uh, that you know, one of the, the consequences uh, of the, um, the conflict uh, in El Salvador uh, is uh, a lot of people, uh, as were mentioned, uh, became uh, refugees uh, to the United States and they uh, included uh, a lot of young men who didn't want to go into the, uh, the military and didn't want to, uh, uh, to join uh, the guerrillas. And, you know, some of them um, uh, ended up in, uh, in jails uh, in uh, the United States. And uh, I think there's um, quite a lot of um, evidence that um, uh, some of the, uh, the gangs that have been uh, responsible for the, um, uh, the violence uh, in El Salvador uh, developed uh, in uh, the Los Angeles County uh, Jail uh, and uh, other uh, institutions where uh, they spent time. Um, uh, in, in the United States. Uh, so those people were deported back to El Salvador after they, uh, they got out of, uh, of jail. And uh, the, uh, the gangs have had a kind of um, Salvadoran-American uh, connection. They, they exist in, uh, in both places. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the difficulties in El Salvador today uh, relate to the, uh, the gang warfare and the very high murder rate uh, is uh, related to the, um, uh, the, uh, the gangs. Uh, so the, the armed conflict uh, in El Salvador and the, the human rights abuses uh, in uh, El Salvador um, uh, disrupted uh, the the whole society, uh, and a lot of the um, the conflict was not limited to the uh, the combatants. Uh, it focused uh, on uh, the civilians. Uh, there was a certain point, for example, when the um, the Salvadoran Air Force uh, was bombing uh, and strafing. Uh, peasants um, in uh, the Salvadoran countryside. Um, they called the peasants the masas, uh, and they said that the, uh, the guerrillas um, uh, only could exist with the support uh, of the, uh, the masas. They got their food, uh, they got their medical care uh, from the, uh, the masas. Again, to tell stories uh, about uh, El Salvador. I can recall uh, going to, uh, to El Salvador uh, at a certain point and one of my um, early stops on every visit uh, that I made uh, to El Salvador was to the um, office of the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, because the, uh, the ICRC people uh, knew a great deal about what was taking place and uh, they kept confidences, but uh, if I was going off in the wrong direction, they would wave their finger at me, and I would know uh, that's not uh, a, a good thing to pursue. And then one time uh, that I went, they were more willing to be uh, forthcoming uh, than any other time, and they told me that uh, they had stopped the use of mobile clinics uh, in uh, territory um, where uh, the guerrillas uh, operated because they said when they had the mobile clinics, um, people would gather from a large area to get uh, medical care at these uh, mobile clinics. And then when the, uh, the, the mobile clinic uh, left, the Salvadoran Air Force would come and strafe uh, the people who had gathered to go uh, to those mobile clinics. And they said they had to discontinue uh, the, uh, the mobile clinics uh, because they couldn't um, subject uh, the, uh, the Salvadoran peasants to, uh, to that kind of um, 
risk of, of death uh, from, from going to them. And uh, I asked them, could I um, uh, raise that question with uh, the U.S. ambassador? And they said yes. And uh, the ICRC didn't ordinarily allow me to, uh, to say anything uh, about uh, uh, what I had learned uh, from them. But on this occasion, they gave me per permission. And the U.S. ambassador at that particular moment was um, the best uh, of the people who were sent uh, as ambassador to, uh, to El Salvador. It was Tom Pickering. Uh, and uh, I went to Pickering and uh, talked about it. And um, uh, Pickering did get uh, a stop to, uh, uh, to that. Uh, but the idea that uh, you would attack civilians g going to a medical clinic um, uh, and that you would strafe uh, people like that is, you know, uh, unbelievable. Uh, and yet that was the kind of attack on civilians uh, that was taking place um, uh, during that people period. And, you know, people fled uh, the country. It disrupted the whole country. And I think the legacy of the gangs um, is uh, a... Uh, to a significant extent, uh, a consequence uh, of uh, the kinds of things that was done were, were done during uh, the, uh, the 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 conflict, and I, I think if El Salvador is to even overcome uh, the kind of violence it suffers from today, it's got to recognize um, uh, its past. It's got to come uh, to grips uh, with its past. Uh, and um, uh, making those connections uh, for people may have to be part of the way uh, in which the society does come to grips with its past. I, I was basically going to, to make that last point there uh, that, I, that I agree wholeheartedly with, and that takes us perhaps full circle to the question of why is it important to pursue these cases decades later? Um, it's because the linkages don't end. Uh, if we're talking about those connections between what's going on today versus 30 to 35 years ago, um, in part, those things are still happening. Uh, in part, we're in a situation uh, that we are in El Salvador because there's never been accountability um, for, for what happened previously. And so I, um, you know, that, that perhaps connects those two points up, which I, which I think is, is fundamentally important and is something that, um, you know, documenting, looking at a current situation uh, is through a lens of what came before is is uh, particularly important. And I think that's certain, and maybe that also ties in with the investigation piece is understanding that history and being able to um, to understand how how the past has impacted the present. Um, I think is 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 of of critical importance. Okay. I think that's the note.